All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and make a basic histogram off of the classes and the frequencies. Now, it's typical in a textbook uh, that they want you to have the bars touch. So in order to do that, we're going to have to subtract a little bit from the lower class limits and add a little bit to the upper class limits. Those are called class boundaries. So I can go ahead and subtract 0.5 and add 0.5. Subtract 0.5 from the lower class limits and add 0.5 to the upper class limits. That way there won't be any gaps between the bars because notice this class ends at 67, this class starts at 68, if I were to use the class limits as is, there would be small gaps between the bars. So along the horizontal axis, I'm going to be using those class boundaries instead of the classes. And for the vertical axis, I'm going to use the frequencies. Now I could easily use the relative frequencies instead of the frequencies. It would not change the look of the histogram. You notice here the tallest bar is going to be 22 if I use frequencies. That would also be the case if I used um, relative frequencies. The tallest bar would be for this class because this has the greatest relative frequency. Okay, so I'm going to um, go ahead and draw uh, xy plane or a pseudo xy plane as neatly as I possibly can and for the um, horizontal axis I'm going to be um, subtracting 0.5 from the first class and adding 0.5 to the um, upper class limit <laughs> to the first class, sorry, getting a little tongue-tied. Now because I'm not starting my horizontal axis from zero, I'm going to make this a broken axis just to let the reader know that either the vertical axis or the horizontal axis is not starting at zero. Okay, so my first tick mark will be 62.5. My second tick mark will be 67.5. And you want to kind of try to make these um, equally spaced. Okay, I'm, I'm not the best artist, so these are actually kind of tricky for me to do by hand. And then my next tick mark will be 73.5. My next tick mark will be 79.5. My next tick mark will be um, 85.5. And then 91.5. And then 98.5. And then for my vertical axis, um, I can just go ahead and um, do the tick marks in in twos. My lowest number of frequencies is three. My largest number of frequencies is 22. I could do fives, the tick marks in fives. Okay, it's up to you. All right, so I've got two, four, six, eight, ten. Again, being as neat as I possibly can, trying to make these equally spaced and hopefully not running out of room. And I will need a 22, because looking at my data set, I do have a class that has 22 values. Okay, so I want to make the height of the bars the number of frequencies. So for this first class, the frequencies is three. So I'm going to make the first bar Uh, three units tall. Again, trying to be as neat as possible. <laughs> Usually my histograms kind of slant, um, lean to the right, leaning tower of histogram. My next class had a, a frequency of six, so the bar 
needs to be a height of six. The next class had uh, 12 frequencies, so I'm going to make that bar a height of 12. And notice when I'm doing this, the bars are touching. There's no gaps between the bars. The next class is that um, tall bar, the tallest one of the group. So I'm going to make it 22 units tall. And then we drop down. The next one is um, a height of four. Okay, very small ish. And then last but not least, we end with a height of three. Same as the first class. All right, so looking at this histogram, it's kind of hard to get a sense of the shape. It does look somewhat symmetric. Okay, if I were to trace the outline of this histogram, okay, I, I've got um, small values here, small values here, and it doesn't appear to have a, a significant amount of skewness. Now, um, what we're looking for when we're talking about skewness, if I trace the outline of a histogram, and the histogram looks like this with a long tail pointing out to the right. That means I've got some extreme upper values. We would call this skewed right. On the other end, if I were to draw a histogram and I have a long tail on the left side and then the data tends to cluster in the upper values, this would be skewed left. And then if I have something that looks, um, if I trace the outline of the histogram, and it turns out to be looking like a bell, we could call that symmetric or bell-shaped. Okay. We could also have um, all of the values tending to be equally likely. And if that were the case, if I had a histogram, for example, that looked like this, where all of the bars are, are whoops, that should be the same width, um, about the same uh, width, we would call this a uniform. Okay, a uniform shape is also symmetric because if we were to divide it down or cut it in half down the middle and fold it in half, the left side would look like the right side. All right, so there's our histogram based off of the, the counts or the frequencies. If I were to change this to relative frequencies, all I would have to do is change my tick marks here to be in terms of um, percents or um, proportions rather than counts, but the overall shape of the histogram would not change. What does change the look of the histogram is if we change the number of classes. If we change the number of classes, then um, the number of bars would change, and it is possible how many falls in each class would change um, respectively.